Hello, hello everybody. It is Wednesday evening, it is eight o'clock UK time and we are back for the new actually format one step workshop. Now I'll give you guys a few minutes to come on the live. So do let me know when you're here and give me a comment to tell me you can hear me to make sure I'm not talking to myself for the next 45 minutes or an hour. Hello there, I can see someone on already. So do say hi, tell me who you are, where you're from so I know who's watching. I'm really excited to be back. It feels like a while ago since I did these. We had a bit of a break over, I guess, sort of spring, summer. We've had lots of amazing guests watching. Terry, great to see you. Hello, hello. Um, good to see you back. Do say hi to the rest of you who are joining as well. Really good to see lots of you joining already. Hoping this is going to be a really fun uh, interactive workshop. Hi, Amanda. Good to see you all the way from Oregon, US. Thank you for joining. What's the weather like over there at the moment? I tend to do a weather update, it's the typical English thing to do. Terry, who's recently moved to Ireland, here in England we've had a really lovely sunny day, as I said in the live earlier on, so it makes life so much uh, nicer, doesn't it, when it's nice weather, you can go outside, get some fresh air, um, and feeling much more energised with daylight outside compared to the winter lives that I do here, um, that are all dark and dingy. Beautiful, amazing, happy to hear that, Amanda. I haven't been to Oregon, I always say I've been to, um, uh, where I've been to Seattle next door, next door sort of, <laughs> but still not to Oregon. I'd love to go. It's such a lovely part of the country. But the rest of you do say hi as well. In the meantime, I'll introduce myself. My name is Anna Anna Lundberg. I'm the founder of One Step Outside, which since there are so many new members here over the last few weeks, I can tell you comes from the quote, everything you've ever wanted is one step outside your comfort zone. And that's really the ethos of this group. Um, okay, so the same poor network connection. Um, which is very odd, but hopefully that's okay. Do um, let me know if there's ever an issue and we'll try to deal with that. Um, so as I said, there's a new topic every week within that theme. Um, and then I also have a podcast, by the way. So if you're like me, um, I'm really obsessed with podcasts at the moment. I'm constantly immersing myself um, in different topics, whether it's personal or professional business um, and so on, life coaching and all these great things. There are so many podcasts now. Um, it is one more avenue. It's a really easy sort of... Um, I guess format to consume on the go you can listen to it as I do when you're doing the dishes or going for a walk or hang up the laundry whatever it is so uh, reimagining success is the name of the podcast and that's something that we'll be talking about a lot as well so again massive welcome to the new members really good to see some familiar faces as well really happy to be back here with you live as some of you will be very aware because you're part of the reason why this has happened and we were doing weekly live sessions actually in the past and a lot of you voted to move to monthly sessions. This works for me of course as well, I'm happy to have one big session where we have lots of you attending and um, I hope it means that more of you can attend because I know you are so busy, that's what we're talking about this evening isn't it? Um, and it really gives us an opportunity to deep dive on a topic. So it may not 100% coincide with those topics and themes we're doing on the blog and the podcast, but it means that you can all really come to me with topics and vote for topics, as you have done this time, um, that are really important to you at the moment. So hopefully this is meaning that we're going to have lots more input from you guys, um, interaction, and I'm calling it the workshop, not just because I like the alliteration of the one-step workshop, but also because I'd really love to have you guys coming as you have been with your questions, with your personal situations, um, and then joining live as well. So really happy to have you all here. I'm um, hoping you'll have lovely sunny weather as um, a couple of us already do as well. Um, but really um, honored that you're spending the time with me because the whole point of tonight's topic um, is of course that we all have way too many things to do. So really um, thrilled really to have you guys here with me. It's a big topic. I'm not entirely sure um, if I can manage this topic that I've now signed up to tell you how to do all the things. So I apologize in advance if I can't give you the magic solution. And um, but hopefully you guys can challenge me throughout the session. We can share our own examples and ideas with each other. I know you all have some incredible um, expertise and experience that you can share as well um, and relying on you to do so as well. So um, as usual, I can't see, oh no, I can see the clock up there, so I'll try to keep it um, probably around 45 minutes in total, so finishing about quarter two, so it's only about half an hour left now. Um, but depending on, of course, the interaction of the group, you know, it may run up to an hour. Um, if you are watching the replay, hello, hello, do say hi as well. Um, tell me you're watching the replay, and if you ask any questions, make any comments, I'll still be able to come back in the next day or so and reply to those. And do reply to each other's comments as well if you see anything interesting. So without further ado, the topic of how to do all the things. This is something, of course, that I struggle with myself. Um, I think you guys do too, since you've turned up here as well. So I'd love to already, if you want to tell me anything about what you think of what comes to mind when you hear this topic of doing all the things. Um, and in particular, balancing work, 
and obligations of earning money, um, you know, doing the dishes, laundry, whatever those um, sort of obligations you have to do, paying bills and so on on the one hand, with everything else. Everything else is a big bucket, of course. It's having fun, it's taking care of your health, your family, yourself, um, traveling, it's probably working on a new business that maybe isn't your primary source of income and so on. So I, as you may know, if you follow me for a while, I'm not a massive fan of the concept of work-life balance. I don't know what you think about this. Anyone like this idea of work-life balance for many reasons? And um, one is I think it's a bit um, sort of impossible, I guess, to achieve that ideal. Um, another is that corporations, of course, have sort of jumped on this bandwagon and they bandy it around um, as if they're doing incredible things when actually they're not really changing so much after all. The so-called flexibility they offer is not so flexible. Um, but more importantly, I don't like the juxtaposition of work on the one side with life on the other. Because as you all know, and I can see lots of people here who I know are doing incredible things, I think you all are, um, life is not you know, on the same equal footing as work. Work is incredibly important. It is the source of money, which lets us eat and take care of ourselves and do all the fun things. It is also hopefully rewarding, fulfilling. Um, it's a social place where we meet colleagues and so on. But it is only, albeit an important one, but only one part of life. So for me, if you have joined recently, you may have seen the Success Audit, which is a resource that we send out to everyone who's new. And if you've been here for a while, you've probably seen it as well. And where I introduced the 5L model, and where we talk about really balancing wellness and well-being fundamentally, and we'll talk about that tonight as well, with your career and impact, which yes is important, but also relationships and romance, learning, personal development and growth, and fun and spontaneity. So for me, there are at least those five areas, if not many more, that we want to be paying attention to, setting goals in, and um, really working towards. So um, if you haven't got that resource, if you're interested, just um, send me a note. Or by the way, I should also say Cara, Cara Cahill, who you may have seen. Um, she's a community manager here on Facebook. You'll hopefully see her around. If you're a new member, she will have messaged you, so do say hi to her. Um, and she'll be posting all sorts of fun things over the coming days and weeks as well. So she's a great support, and I'm very happy to have her. Um, so I'm not seeing any comments yet, so if anyone's still watching and still awake, then do tell me yes, <laughs> and um, we'll dive straight in. Thank you so much for those of you who've sent your questions. If anything else pops up, obviously we'll try to cover as much as we can, and again, let's um, really bounce ideas off each other too, because I, and by no means um, I'm pretending to be some incredible guru who has all the answers here. Ellen says yes, that's great. Um, but I guess first to explore what the issue is, um, and I think, you know, especially with work, whether actually we're still in that corporate nine to five that I'm always talking about. Um, of course, it's never just the nine to five. It is often, as someone pointed out on my post on Facebook, you know, it's like eight till eight, or some people even work night shifts, five till nine, um, where it's overtime in the evenings, weekends, holidays. Part of it is because of technology, which is incredible. It means that I can talk to you all now. It means we can check in from uh, Bali, for that matter. But it also means, of course, we're expected to be always on. I saw a quote, I think, on Instagram just um, this afternoon that was saying, you know, if work expects us to check in on work things when we're in our personal space, we should also be allowed to do personal things in our workspace. So there's a new idea of work-life integration that you may have heard of, and um, which I've written about before as well. Um, so rather than balance of saying work is over here, hello Mildred, good to see you as well, great to have you back, and um, work over here, life on that side, that's sort of putting the two against each other, it's more about integrating it. And I think that's one of the benefits of running your own show, running your own business, because you can really make it much more fluid. Um, you can run and pick up your kids uh, from the school when they're ill and take them to the doctor, or you can run your errand or do some shopping and then work in the evening if you want to. Um, you can take some days off to go to a friend's birthday or whatever and have a nice lunch, um, and then you can maybe work the weekend if needed. Yeah, Denise, I'll, um, I'll uh, try to remind me if I don't do it, but I'll pull out my um, article that I wrote on work-life integration. I think the danger, and this is again leading up to sort of the issue here, I guess, is that that's the corporate nine to five that I said, that that's really the sort of your employers expecting you to be always on. We're checking in on emails, on our phones, Blackberries, whatever it is these days, weekends, holidays and so on. Most people check their emails on the way to and from work. Um, you know, we're doing it uh, when we really should be having personal time. So that's the corporate space. But even when we start our own businesses, um, it may be that we end up working even harder than ever before. Because 
Um, we're really passionate about the work, so we love it. And I certainly said at the beginning, um, I, uh, I love my work, so it doesn't matter that I'm working too much, which I think is a bit misleading. I think we can tell ourselves that, but the fact that we're doing incredible, fun, rewarding work doesn't mean the work is the only thing that's important. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's gonna be sustainable to our health, to our relationships and so on, if we push ourselves too much. I'm really glad to see that you're liking um, the um, idea of work-life integration. Um, the, uh, what was I gonna say about blah, blah, blah. The other danger with work-life integration, just to put the other side of the coin, is that you don't set any boundaries. I now have a study, I moved into this new flat um, in December. Um, I have a door that I can close. When I finish tonight, I can go back into my life and that's now a very sort of physical way of setting the boundary, closing the door. Um, I can turn off the notifications on my phone, shut down my laptop, that's really important. Um, I was going through a phase of, of much more integration um, and then it was really overflowing too much and that's where it gets dangerous if you're constantly again checking your phone, working all the time um, and nothing is ever enough. So that's just the other side of it and of course as I always say it's really up to you to define where that line is, what are those boundaries, um, you know, where is the boundary between work and play, work and life, whatever you want to call it. Um, thank you, Denise. That's very lovely of you to say. I had my hair in plaits today, so that's why it's um, curly slash frizzy, depending on how you look at it. So I'm not entirely sure why it's shiny, but it's very kind of you to say. Um, so Denise is saying, I used to say all the time my other role, I love my work and it took me to burnout. Yes, exactly, Denise. Really sorry to hear that. And that is unfortunately the danger. Um, I see it again and again in some really um, passionate entrepreneurs as well. And um, we're all, I think, really self-motivated, passionate people. So whether we're in that corporate job um, and Ellen said, you're very pretty lucky with your corporate life, so that's good news. Um, whether we're in a job, a charity, corporation, whatever, um, or we're running our own show, you know, it's really down a lot to our own personality, isn't it? There's also the pressure of other people around us, of course, living up to other people's expectations. But generally, I think we're sort of smart, capable, self-motivated, passionate people. And I think we have to somehow calm ourselves down, channel um, that energy that we have, sort of directed in the right direction to create incredible things that we wanna do, but at the same time, I don't wanna say limit ourselves, but maybe hold the reins back a little bit um, just to make sure that we're not pushing ourselves to burn out as well. <clears throat> Very rare you have own time, that's good, Ellen. I have to say that when I, just as an aside, when I first quit my job, it was in 2013, I was doing still corporate um, client projects, and one um, client I had in the contract, and I guess it was the client who wrote the contract, not me, um, paid overtime. So it meant that yes, I was working way too much. I worked late into the evenings. Um, I was traveling to Amsterdam every week to work with a digital agency on this massive website project and so on, but I was getting paid for it. The next client I worked with, it's explicitly said no overtime. So you can bet that at this time I made sure I came to the office for nine um, and I left at 5.30 on the dot because there was no um, motivation. Now that might sound like I'm not committed to the job, but it's much easier to have that distance, I think, when you're an external consultant rather than when you're deep um, in your elbows into the sort of corporate um, political life, I guess. So just to say that, yeah, over time I think is okay, maybe if it's temporary, if it's a one-off thing, and if you're getting paid for it and so on, but if it's the expectation, you know, there's something really wrong. So that's really the issue, I think. It's the always on, it's the busyness syndrome. And unfortunately, even when, and I know some of you here, I know we've been working together on escaping that corporate life, even whilst we've made that escape, it's easy to get caught up again in that same sort of we're recreating the same cage as it were that we had before. So before we were saying, oh, it's the job and it's our boss and so on, but there must be some other common denominator, of course, once we've left, if we're then recreating that space. Part of it is the culture, I think, you know, and um, I often hear from mums, I guess in particular, but a lot of freelancers, you know, we say, oh, I feel so guilty. And I think one of you guys mentioned the guilt too. I feel guilty taking time off in the afternoon um, to go to my daughter's school or to go to Sainsbury's or whatever it is to go food shopping because I feel like I should be working because that culture of the so-called nine to five is so deeply ingrained. But by the way, of course, if you've um, read this, or if you've heard this before, it's quite a recent concept, the nine to five, you know, before people were working much longer hours. So the nine to five was already a pretty good um, step forward in theory when it came. But that's the issue and probably you're all familiar with the issue because um, that's why you're here. And we talk a lot about juggling balls, right? So I talk about those five different areas of your life. We talk about work life, whether it's balance or integration. I think several of you mentioned your health. And um, we have hobbies. I think there's quite a few adventurers here who are doing, um, you know, trips away or whatever it might be. Um, 
I don't know, paddle boarding perhaps, Terry, or, um, you know, hikes or other adventures and trips, and we like to travel um, and so on, and we like to spend time with our friends and family. There are a lot of things there, lots of hobbies, lots of interests. Um, I, again, my personality is very much sort of focused on learning, um, multi-passionate, whatever term you want to use. Um, and I have a piano next to me here that I haven't touched in probably a year, I'm going to say now, which is very sad. No, maybe a few months, I'll say, because I have played a couple of times. I have my ukulele, which I loved learning a few years ago, which I don't play very often. I love paddleboarding. I haven't been um, in quite some time now again and so on. So, you know, I think what the, what the overall principle is you can have all the things, but you maybe can't have all the things all the time. I'm just going to check in on the comments before I go into some of the solutions maybe to these things and all your questions as well. So Denise is saying, with my previous registration with Ofsted and the role I had, it was never switch off. My life's changed now as I build a new one. Hooray, lighter. I love that word, Denise. Um, but I do think it's important, as you say, to remember ourselves. And you touched on something important, which is remembering the why. Um, it's a bit of a cliche, perhaps, that the Simon Sinek start with why. But remembering why we started our business in the first place, why we left that job, why we've made this particular choice in the past or at this particular moment, um, and reminding ourselves, you know what, the whole reason why I started this business was to have more time for X, Y, Z. So if I don't have time for X, Y, Z now, something is maybe wrong and it's, it's time to sort of redefine, um, either redefine what your success looks like or probably maybe the parameters of your day to day. Um, let's just see the other comments here. Ellen says, I want to get the tools and habits in place before I leave corporate life. Love that, Ellen. I think that's incredibly sensible um, and you'll avoid a lot of um, time wasted that some of us have to go through, you know, mistakes we make. Um, I mentioned there my sort of consulting time those two years. That was the pendulum swinging to one end where I was working too much. I had some balance. I had, you know, I had incredible travels between my contracts, but then I sort of went too much in the direction of actually jumping onto the nearest life raft, I think I'd say. Having left my job, I sort of held on to a very similar scenario. Then I went through what I like to call my hippie phase, when I wasn't earning very much money, and I wasn't work working very much, I was sort of writing some blogs sometime, and, and you know, sending some articles off perhaps, and learning to coach, yes, but you know, I wasn't really taking the business seriously. That was my hippie phase, and when I was working too little, and now I'm very much, as you said, putting those, or I have been the last couple of years, putting those um, structures in place, having clear goals, having the plan, working with my coach and so on. Um, so you're very smart, all that to say, Ellen, you're very sensible to actually put that in place before you leave. Um, especially, of course, if you're you know, building a side hustle, let's say, which a lot of you do, um, if you have one main source of income, perhaps, Again, as I have had, I've had marketing consulting still as my main source, doing something else um, alongside building up the coaching, the writing. Um, Sarah, who's here in the group, for example, has had PR as her big thing. She's now building up a shiatsu practice. Um, so, you know, if you also have two different income streams or jobs, whether it's temporary or that's your long-term plan, that's complicating things as well. So again, really great to put those tools and habits in place before, but fear not if you have already left, you know, we can make different choices every day. Um, and it's all about sort of learning and growing and evolving with it, isn't it? So, but um, great to hear that you're doing that, Ellen. Um, but I think there's sort of two levels we want to address this at. And one is the big picture and one is the day to day. And I think we've touched a little bit on that already. And some of your questions reflected that too. One, and I have to say this over and over, is to get clear on that big picture of what success is for you. Why are you setting up this business? Let's say use that as a specific example, because I think that's our common denominator here. Um, you know, what are the important principles? What are the criteria, the parameters? Um, and importantly, you know, we say, um, I need to earn enough money. I need more clients. Um, I need to work more, more, more. But the question is, what is enough? Um, and often we haven't defined what enough is. We don't know how much money we need to cover our expenses. That's always a good start to see, okay, to at least let's say maybe replace our private salary, or maybe we don't even need to replace the whole salary, we can actually just earn less than that, um, that will cover our bills and so on, but really define what enough is in terms of money, because otherwise there is no limit, you can always do more. You'll always say yes to every client that comes along because, oh yeah, that's good to get more money, and I couldn't possibly say no because you know I should be grateful that I have any clients at all and so on. Clients, again, you know, if you have a clear business model of understanding this is um, the package I have, these are the types of clients I work with, this is what I charge, then you know, okay, in order to reach my goals for this year that I've just defined, um, I need five new clients a month, 10 new clients, whatever it is. Um, if you see that you need a thousand new clients, maybe that's unrealistic and you realize, hang on a second, this is not going to work. And then you can either put a plan in place 
um, to achieve that goal somehow, um, or you can shift it around and change your pricing and packages and so on. So um, having those really clear goals, the big picture understanding of why you're in business, what's important, and then the criteria of how much money do you need, um, of course the business model, which is a whole topic for another time, um, you know, I want to be able to work from home every day, I don't want to commute, um, I don't want to do overtime maybe, um, or whatever it might be, I want to have time to do X, Y, Z, that big picture of understanding really what's important to you has to come first, but then there is the other piece, and I think was it you Ellen asking about sort of the tools and tricks um, and really the systems you can use in the day-to-day -day. because ultimately it's what we're doing every day and um, that adds up to the big picture right so I can have these incredible goals for the next three years five years ten years and um, but if I'm not actually doing um, the things every day consistently then I'm never gonna get there I have a framed um, quote over here on my piano that I haven't played in months that says discipline is remembering what you want and um, which I really love discipline is remembering what you want so you know, let's say I really want to lose weight or whatever it might be, you know, today I need to remind myself, you know what, I'm not going to eat those three pieces of cake because I want to lose weight and I have to have that discipline every day. Or, um, oh, I'm so tired now after work, I just want to go and veg on the sofa and watch Netflix, which I do do, of course, as well. <laughs> um, however, I know that what I want is to escape this job eventually, to set up my own business, to travel the world, whatever it is. So I know I need to now go off and spend an hour, whatever it is, on my business. So again, big picture um, of what it is you want, the vision, and then also the day-to-day -day as well. Does that make sense? That I think we need to address it on both um, levels. Um, and so if you don't yet know why you want to quit or why you have quit, or if you can't remember or whatever it is, then I think it's worth thinking back to that or really spending some time exploring that on the big picture level. Um, and then also checking in regularly. And um, we talk a lot about in my programs, time management ideas and time blocking and so on. We'll touch on that in a minute. Um, but really we need to sort of check in once a week and think, okay, my goals up for this year are this, or um, my biggest priorities are the business in this way and so on. Does my week actually reflect that? Because again, if my goal is over here and my week is doing all this stuff, um, it's not actually gonna add up. So Amanda, the quote was, discipline is remembering what you want. Um, so it's just sort of reminding yourself every day if necessary, every week, this is what I'm working towards and why it's important to me. Um, fab makes sense, says Denise, that's great. And um, the example I give as well is writing. Um, I've always, since I was little, wanted to be a writer, whatever that looks like. Um, speaking of redefining success, you know, I realised that I'm not going to be, probably won't be JK Rowling um, or Stephen King. For me it's important to write because I enjoy that. Um, it's important for me to have that book in my hand, it feels incredible, and for other people to read and for it to make a difference to them. Um, so knowing that I want to be a writer, if I then look at my calendar, my diary, and see, hang on, um, Mondays I'm, um, I don't know, doing webinars and this, that and the other, Tuesdays I'm doing working this consulting project, and Wednesdays I'm doing coaching, uh, Thursdays, etc. Fridays, hang on a second, where is writing in that day? So I'm saying a big picture, oh, I want to be a writer, but never in my week. Am I actually writing, um, drafting a book, planning articles, pitching magazines, whatever it is. So again, it's the big picture of knowing what it is you're working towards and then making sure that your day-to-day -day diary actually has those elements on it. Um, so again, really big vision, uh, goal for the future, whatever long, um, however long you want that to be. Um, but also then the more tactical sort of time management principles and um, systems and so on. Yes, exactly. Thank you so much, Mildred, for capturing that so we all have it as well. Um, it's always helpful to have these quotes that are meaningful to you, whether you put it on your Instagram or your wall or whatever it is. I've also just got a sticker, by the way, that has my everything you've ever wanted is one step outside your comfort zone. So watch out for that in the next video. And by the way, I forgot to say, I think I've been away so long that um, my plant has died. So I don't know if you can tell. I've forgotten to water it. So that's what happens when you don't um, uh, sort of water your, um, literally water your plants or nurture um, the things in your life that are important. <clears throat> so I want to already pick up on some questions because as ever we get into these interesting discussions and we um, suddenly the time has passed. But Ellen, you asked, and this was a key question, how do you prevent as many balls from dropping as possible? And I think that's quite tying in quite nicely with what we were just saying, in that first of all, you have to define what those balls are. <laughs> so do you know how many balls you have? Do you know what the balls are? Um, and do you know if they really are important? Are they balls that you actually want to be juggling in the first place? Does it matter if they get dropped, right? 
Um, balls is one image. I again remember um, one of my first months, I think, at Procter & Gamble, I was working, this big like guru marketing guy came and spoke to us about work-life balance, ironically. And he talked about the five big rocks too many, says Ellen. Yes, that is the problem, isn't it? Um, and as I said to Terry the other day, when everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. So if we have, you know, if we say um, these 20 things are priorities, Obviously, none of them are priorities because you can't prioritise 20 things every day, every minute, every week, and so on. Um, so this idea from Stephen Covey, I think, came originally um, from um, the guy who wrote Seven Habits of the Highly Effective People. There are five big rocks. And the story as it went um, from this guru, I forget now exactly what he said, but he had, you know, I'm a husband, I'm a son, um, I'm a corporate marketing manager, I am a, let's say, brother, or friend, let's say friend, and I am a golf player. He played golf every Saturday and Sunday of the weekend after working really hard in the office Monday to Friday. Now, he then had a child, or maybe even two children, and it became a little bit unsustainable, thank goodness he realised this, um, for his wife to be at home with the babies, um, and for him to head off every Saturday and every Sunday to play golf. So he realised in order to replace one of these rocks, or in fact, in order to add a rock that was father, he had to remove one rock, which turned out to be golf player. Now, it doesn't mean you have to stop playing golf for the rest of your life. It just means that for this period of your children being young, probably for the sake of your relationship with your children and with your wife, um, you can't then head off and be a golf player every Saturday and Sunday. You know, likewise, um, maybe I was going through my, that hippie phase when I was playing lots of ukulele and traveling and doing all sorts of crazy things and paddle boarding and so on. At that time, that was possible. I wasn't focusing so much on the business. Now maybe I'm focusing more on the business, maybe a couple of those things have had to sort of drop off um, as well. So again, five rocks is one um, element, one, what's the word, one metaphor that you can use, or the balls. Now people say three balls, yes, don't worry, Terry, I'm going to talk about that in a second, but do share your experience there, um, because I love that metaphor as well. Um, whether it's three or five or 10, I can't be the one who, to tell you this. Um, you know, I have the five L's model that I talked about. So it could be that it's, you know, love is one thing, health is one thing, work is one thing, um, what are the others? Uh, learning is one thing and fun is one thing. That's one model. If that resonates with you, then you can use that. And you can, at the beginning of every year, and we always do this here in the group, so you can join us in December, January of next year to set up for 2020, my goodness, 2020. Um, but then we look at those five areas and you might have, you know, one sort of priority in each area. You might want to have the five rocks. Again, it's five, so maybe five is a good number. Too many, I think Ellen is not a good number, so maybe get a bit more specific there. Um, it could be three things if you want less. Maybe it could be 10 things, I don't know. But again, there is no exact right number. The point is you need to know how many balls they are and you need to know what those balls are. Now, the second question, and Terry's already anticipated this, and this is a metaphor that I think probably changed my life too, um, is to define what these balls are made of. Are they made of crystal? Are they made of glass? Which means that if you drop them, they shatter into a million pieces, forever lost, and you're not going to be able to glue them back together. Or are they made of rubber and they're going to bounce straight back up again when you're ready to pick them up? Um, now, oh, another, that's, sorry, going off on a tangent. Another one is the spinning plate analogy. Have you seen that? I think some people have done that. There's probably a YouTube video um, that once you've started spinning a plate, um, it actually has a lot of momentum. It can go for a while without you coming back and spinning it. But once you've been spinning lots of other plates for a while, you then have to come back to that initial plate and spin it. Does that make sense from my rambling? I think that's another metaphor that might sort of click with you. Um, and this may even have a bit of a sort of a, a grain of um, a solution for us um, because yes, we want to spin all these plates, but we can't possibly be actively spinning each of them all the time. So it might be that this year I decide that my relationship with my partner and my family is the most important. So I'll be spinning those actively while I let the business and the other things just kind of spin on with their own momentum. Now next year, or maybe even in the autumn, I need to come back and give those plates another spin in order to go back to my family, if that's what I want to do, um, because I can't leave them forever to spin or they will also come crashing down. So that's another metaphor um, that could be helpful as well. But again, are your balls crystal glass or are they rubber? Um, so for example, they're maybe too um, sort of simplified, but still it sort of illustrates the point. Um, my health, my well-being, and I know again, several of us have talked about this, whether it's migraines or um, heading towards burnout and so on, mental health is really important too. Um, and that, I would argue, is a crystal ball, it's glass, it will shatter. And when you are your business, 
taking care of yourself is taking care of your business. Say it together with me. Um, so, you know, you might think that, oh, I, I can keep going. I can add more work. I have to because I need more money. I haven't got enough clients. I'm juggling all these things. Um, but actually, you know, if you don't take care of yourself, then it's not going to be very long lasting, this business of yours. So health tends to be one that's probably glass. Um, your relationship with your partner, with your children, probably your baby um, might not survive so long if you neglect them for a few weeks or months. Um, so some of those things are very much your crystal glass balls. Maybe an elderly relative, super important, um, because otherwise, you know, it'll be um, too late. There is a lovely Cara. Hi, Cara. Great to see you from all the way from very hot and sweaty Florida. Um, so that's the glass ball. Now, the other type is the rubber ball. And it is hard because when we do this exercise, it's so easy to say, oh, they're all glass, they're all priorities. But again, remember, if everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority. Um, so we really need to be honest with ourselves and think, okay, within my business, will someone really notice if I don't put up that blog post next week? Now, some of you, as my incredible fans, might say, yes, of course, Anna will notice. I think the truth is probably not. So although it's important to me to have the podcast every week, and Cara does an amazing job putting out the podcast, the blog post, um, we do this workshop and so on. Ultimately, if I were to have to be ill, I've got a bit of a sore throat now, so maybe I'll be ill next week, who knows? you'll probably survive, the business will probably survive if I don't do that for a week or if we reuse a past blog post or um, if Cara comes up with some other fun thing that she can post about, right? So, you know, although the business as a whole won't survive if I go silent for six months, probably, or at least it'll take a step back, and there are elements within that, we miss an email, a blog post, whatever it might be, um, that probably could survive and bounce right back up again. Does that make sense? And can anyone think of any other examples, either that you think, oh my gosh, that is definitely a rubber ball, um, which maybe helps you as it did Terry, um, or maybe if you're stuck and you're thinking, hang on, is this a crystal ball or is it a rubber ball? Things like, you know, some of our sort of passion projects, you know, writing a book, launching a podcast, um, are actually rubber balls, if they're even balls at all, <laughs> because they could be priorities for us, but nobody else will actually care if I don't publish my book nobody will care if I don't um, launch my podcast. Now, they might love it once I get it out there, but until they know that I'm going to do that, of course, um, it's not really gonna change their life. So I think a little bit is just a bit of common sense um, and taking a step back. Always good to, you know, have a shower, a bath, go for a run, go away for the weekend and think, hang on a second, I'm so sort of into the details here. I think this is such an important thing, but actually, in the big scheme of things. Look at the stars, that always helps me. You realize we're just this tiny little insignificant thing on this planet and my worries are actually not so big after all. So what do you think? Any balls, examples that you can give and before I move on? But again, what are your balls? Maybe five balls, does that sound reasonable? <clears throat> do you think that's completely unrealistic to be able to limit your things to five balls? What do you think? Um, spinning plates is another analogy you can use, or the rocks. Um, what else could we use? We can use all sorts of analogies that you uh, you want, but the balls have worked for um, Terry here, for example. So what are the balls? How many are there? And then are they glass or are they rubber? So that's sort of a big picture, really. Five sounds good. Maybe we'll go with five, and Terry thinks good too. Great. I'll go off and write my five as well. So if anyone wants to share their five with me um, later in the week for a bit of accountability, either privately or publicly in the group, then maybe we'll get that going as a thread um, and we'll see if we can begin as a first step um, because of course we want to be taking action here and not just having this nice little conversation but really thinking and doing something specific. So let's say that as a homework we're all going to define what our five um, balls are <clears throat> and then again if you want to keep it uh, personal um, let me know in, you know, in, um, by direct message or if you want to share it um, if they're rubber balls or if they're crystal balls and that's very personal and um, again if they're all crystal balls take a step back think hang on a second is that really true am I being a bit sort of um, sort of, not, not arrogant, but a bit sort of unrealistic where everything being so important that maybe you need a bit of perspective. Again, we can have it all, but we can't have it all right now. And um, these another example that comes to mind is last year, and I tend to do this in my business, this year is a bit calmer, but last year I wanted to launch a group program, I wanted to launch my podcast, I wanted to write my book, and I was trying to do all three at once. Of course, I ended up doing none of them very well. Whatever it was that happened, I don't know if it was my coach who helped me or some sensible person helped me understand, I can't do them all in one go. So I launched my group program in the first quarter. The book became, finally, um, I gave myself, I think, three months and I launched on my birthday, 3rd of October. And then the podcast, would you believe it was um, set up in December. So I really got to the end of the year and I thought, oh my goodness, I really have to do this now. I said I'd do it this year. 
boom, had to do it in December, right at the end. But I managed to do those three massive things. I was incredibly proud of myself, it was fulfilling, and made a big difference in my business, but I couldn't do them all at the same time. However, it's very much feasible to do them over time. So again, if you have to say no, if something isn't one of your five right now, or if you're deciding, you know what, it is a rubber ball, I would love to write this book, but right now, that's not something um, that's going to, you know, keep me alive, keep my child alive, keep my short-term needs alive and so on, then perhaps that's something we can sort of let spin with the momentum, let bounce over there, and then we can pick it up again later on. Great, so five balls. Now, um, Caitlin, I don't think you're here, Caitlin, but if you're watching the replay, um, I think this is a really good question as well. How do you know when you've gone, gone from having really well-deserved fun to just being lazy or using it as an excuse um, not to move forward. And I think we talk a lot about procrastination, right? Um, and I think there's a couple of things I wanna say here, and if anyone wants to jump in as well, then please do to help Caitlin out. And um, the first thing I think is a gut feeling, um, because I think we all have that sort of niggling feeling in the back of our, I'm touching my stomach now, so it's definitely got a feeling in the back of our heads when we know that this isn't actually what we should be doing and we don't quite enjoy it to its fullest. Um, again, I remember from school, and of course I wasn't this wise at the time, um, but if I would postpone my homework, if I was allowed, if my parents weren't around, I would do the fun thing first. Let's say I'd watch Neighbours, a horrible Australian TV show that we liked watching um, back in the day. Um, if I watched the TV first, then I'd be thinking about my homework throughout that whole so-called fun thing, and I'd still need to do the homework later, right? However, if I had been clever, one of those good girls who actually did the homework first, because you anyway have to do the homework at some point, eat the frog, as the saying goes, do the hard thing first, and then you can actually enjoy neighbours or whatever it is afterwards. So really simple example, but I think as an adult, we can see that, you know what, if we have to do this thing, um, it's not gonna be any more fun if we put postpone it until the night before, late into the night, I'm just gonna get stressed, I'll get a migraine, it won't be so good, my client won't be happy with it, or you know, I'll burn out, whatever it is. So can we eat that frog? Can we do the difficult thing first? So again, I think it's a bit of a gut feeling. If you're out there on your paddleboard and feeling, oh my God, this is the most incredible thing, not a care in the world, probably that's a really well-deserved, good thing to do. It's a break from everything. Um, it's an incredible experience and so on. However, if you're thinking the whole way, oh my goodness, I shouldn't be doing this. I, I promised Terry I'd do this. I meant to email Ellen. I had this massive project for Mildred, whatever it is then I think, you know, there's a bit of disconnect. So one thing is your gut feeling. And the second thing is to be intentional about it. So to make sure it's well deserved, first of all, I should say, I think we all deserve some fun now and then. I think most of the time we're not celebrating enough. We're pushing ourselves too hard again, I think is our personality. Um, but being intentional about it. So rather than me um, plonking myself down after a long day of work in front of the TV, turning on, ending up watching three, four hours of whatever happens to be on, I've then wasted that time. I haven't really enjoyed it because it was kind of rubbish TV that happened to be on, but I also haven't made any progress. I haven't played the piano, I haven't made any progress on my project for Mildred, um, and that's it. However, if I think, okay, I am going to work on that project for Mildred for an hour, send the email to Terry, call Ellen, whatever it is, or maybe not all three things, but you know what I mean, um, and then once I finish that, I'm gonna go and watch my favorite TV show. I'm gonna finish Stranger Things on um, Netflix, whatever it is, and I'm gonna really enjoy that. Um, again, sounds simple and let me know what you think of this and, and if it's um, something that's too simple or if it doesn't really um, help you at all. Um, but I think just being intentional about I am now going to go off and have this bit of fun. And um, I am deserving this because I have done XYZ project and um, I set these three goals and I have achieved those goals and therefore I can now go off and take some time. And by the way, um, setting those goals again is the important piece, right? Because there's never um, if you have like a never ending to-do list, you're never gonna get through it and there'll always be more and so you're never gonna feel like you can actually take that time off. So making sure you have the five rocks, the one goal for today, the three goals, whatever it is, and then planning some specific fun. Doesn't that sound like fun to plan, spontaneity and fun, um, and watching your favorite TV program, having that nice chocolate cake that's your favorite, going for a long walk, going paddleboarding, whatever it is, and do it intentionally rather than have it just happen um, and again, you, you're watching some rubbish TV that you're not that interested in. <clears throat> so Ellen's talking about the five, um, pulling the five apart, whether health and adventure are the same or separate as health is training for the adventure. Ooh, that's an interesting one, Ellen. Um, and that is the challenge of the five, isn't it? I think it's sort of understanding what is the dominant piece there, because there's health in the sense of just sort of fundamental looking after myself, emotional, mental, physical health. 
And then as you say, there's the travel, the, sorry, the travel, the training for your particular adventure. Um, by the way, this comes to mind another piece, which is, um, I think what Stephen Covey said, I think he had, I want to say seven, just because it was seven habits, but I could be wrong. Maybe it was eight, actually. He said you had eight roles. Um, so that could be adventurer, it could be one of those roles, right? It could be, I am an adventurer, I am a mother, I am a daughter, I am a partner, I am a friend, um, I am a, an entrepreneur, um, and so on. <clears throat> So you could also think of it in terms of roles. Funny enough, when I did that exercise, when I was in my corporate job, none of those eight roles was marketer or employee or corporate uh, person or whatever. So that was sort of one of the um, inklings that I got that perhaps that wasn't an important part for me. Um, but again, you know, I'm a businesswoman, I'm a partner, I'm an adventurer, and then maybe right now in my life, unfortunately, me personally, I'm not so adventurous. So maybe that, that sort of falls off from the five for now. But great question, Alan. And again, let's see what everyone comes up with. I'll post a thread and where we can see what those five pieces are. I'm going to have to think about it as well um, and see if they need to be broken apart or if they are um, really one and the same. <clears throat> um, so that was Caitlin's question. Let me see. Gosh, I've got lots to go through. Oh, Terry, I do want to touch on Terry's question. I'm hoping that some of you can help here because it's quite a specific um, situation. Um, Terry was saying, which is great, that she's getting better um, at this, which is great. I know you've worked on it, Terry, and these balls helped you as well. But Terry is a social media manager managing lots of different accounts and you're sort of expected especially to be always on, right, 24 seven. And I don't know if there's any um, other social media managers here in the group, Cara, maybe you can answer if you're still watching. Um, but the question is, you know, how can you um, make sure that you have time to yourself? How can you turn off? Are there any tips and tricks? I think it also applies to any entrepreneur in today's space because I, as well, I'm not a social media manager for lots of different clients, um, but I definitely have, um, oh, and Terry, I'll try to remind me, Remind me to um, connect you with Rachel because Rachel um, talked about this a few months ago in a mastermind that we were in and, and she was managing lots of different social clients. So give me a ping if I, um, if I don't connect you. Um, but as any entrepreneur, we are always on. I'm on with you now at eight o'clock in the evening and some of you are watching the UK too. Um, you know, I am checking Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn every day. Um, you know, it is a challenge for all of us, I think. So again, a couple of things that work for me um, are specifically turning off notifications. I've turned off all those pesky red circles on my phone. It might not be possible for you during your working hours, but maybe you can have that, okay, I am um, going to be working, let's not say nine to five, what should we say? I don't know, Terry, what are your working hours? But let's say either you decide personally for yourself and or you've agreed that with your client, right? Because if your client expects, and I did work with a corporate client who um, expected the channels to be managed 24 seven. Um, and we realized that there was no one in the team that sort of been allocated to work at weekends. So there's some massive complaint that could have caused sort of a PR um, fiasco at the weekend or a crisis. And there was no one really allocated to answer that. So, you know, let's say you're applying on social media in a big company, you need to point to, um, you need to include uh, the PR team. Maybe you need to talk to the uh, technical guys who can explain that you need to talk to the senior boss who's going to approve it or whatever it is, a copywriter has to write it, someone has to post it and so on. Um, so really having that sort of line of um, approval and um, who's going to do what. Forever and ever, again, Terry, like Ellen said with her too many balls, I think forever and ever is not so good. Um, good at doing early morning, surfing between, yay for surfing, then back online late afternoon, evening. Um, it's a good, let's see, oh, good life. Well, there you go, Terry. Perfect, you should be doing this training for us. Um, but I think again, again, it is an important question and hopefully there's someone else who's watching the replay too, maybe you can shed some light on it. But I think the answer has to be agree with yourself and with your clients what the hours are that you're covering um, and then find it literally a technical solution to turn it off, right? It might be that you have a separate Instagram account, of course, for yourself versus your business, let's say, or for your clients. Um, it means, you know, making sure that you sign out of, in fact, some people have, you know, which you're not supposed to do, but some people will create a separate Facebook account um, that they use for their work stuff. And then they, um, you know, have their sort of other one for, for everything else, their personal things and their own businesses and so on. Um, so those are a couple of ideas. So I don't know if that answers your question, Terry. Um, that's in terms of sort of the technical stuff. The guilt, again, is what we were talking about. So the guilt has to be, and um, I think Caitlin was asking about that as well. Um, has to be around knowing what your goals are, what are your standards as well as your clients, of course, if you're working with other clients, and then when is enough enough? Um, when have you actually, because you can always do more, you can always do a bit more, work a bit longer and so on. Um, but knowing um, that this is what I've agreed, this many hours, 
um, you know, these many posts, this whatever, and then once you've done that again, having that clear goal, so you've actually achieved it. Um, and just to jump to a few tools, because I can see we're already at 10 to nine, um, and I'm gonna throw some things at you. If any of these sound interesting and you don't think I've covered them enough, then let me know. Um, but one of them for this one is the 80-20. Um, so you may have heard of the Pareto Principle, um, which is that basically, I think it was something to do with agriculture in Italy, um, but essentially one example is 20% of your clients are generally generating 80% of your income. So knowing what those 20% are, so again, you know, we have the five rocks, the five balls, now we have sort of the 20% of your clients, so looking at your roster, who are the ones who are repeat clients, who are paying on time always, who are great to work with and so on, um, and are creating you know, 80% of income. On the other hand, the formula also works for other things. So probably there are 20% of your clients who are creating 80% of your stress, for example, and maybe you can get rid of those 20%. 20% um, of your effort creates 80% of the outcome, essentially. Um, in my job before, we also used, and I think it's the wrong way to use it, but it can be useful here. We always said, oh, 80-20, meaning done is better than perfect, um, in the sense of, you know what, um, yes, I could, spend another five hours on this but will it really get that much better incrementally it's just going to get a little bit better um, and actually you know the i'm happy with it now it's good enough and um, the client is happy and that's fine this is not to say we should lower our standards and um, it's not to say we should produce shoddy work and i know we all want to do great things and be proud of ourselves and we're professional and so on it just means that, that tiny little incremental thing when you're putting a lot of effort in but not getting a lot out maybe that's not necessary so that's one tool, 80-20. And going back to this idea of TV and homework and Caitlin's question around, and, and Terry as well, feeling guilty. <clears throat> Another tool we used at PMG, and I think that may have come from Stephen Covey too, I'm not sure, was the urgent important grid. Has anyone seen that? It's four boxes. You've got um, urgent, not urgent, important, not important. And we tend to spend a lot of our time in urgent and important. So it's firefighting, um, it's oh my God, I have to do this now because I've suddenly had um, a breakdown and I have to see a therapist or I've suddenly um, got like a pneumonia and I have to go to the doctor or I've burnt out and I have to see someone or um, suddenly there's this deadline that I've missed um, that's due tomorrow and I have to suddenly do it, right? So it's urgent and important, we spend our time there. Um, when other people come to us with things, so maybe Ellen, making, maybe I shouldn't use Ellen, maybe I'll say John over here because we don't know John. John is constantly coming to me with his really urgent things. So they're urgent for him, but they're not important or urgent for me actually. So if I value my relationship, John, then maybe I might prioritize those things. Um, if he's my boss, maybe I have to prioritize those things. Um, but ultimately those are things that are urgent and important for other people, but not for me. There's also important, but not urgent. And that's an area that we tend to unfortunately deprioritize. Um, it's something that because we're constantly fighting fires over here, we're not doing these things that actually will become urgent at some point, um, but are incredibly important. So maybe those things are, again, our health, um, or sort of the longer term strategic things. Maybe we're hustling away with our current clients and we're not prioritizing um, business development and getting those clients in the future, for example. So that's important, but not urgent. And then there's not important, not urgent, which obviously we should spend very little time in. Um, TV, by the way, can be important in the sense that if it's something, and TV might not be your favorite thing, but you know, TV or um, surfing um, or whatever it might be, if you're doing it again intentionally um, to take time off to really enjoy it and so on, that is actually important. Maybe not urgent, sometimes it's urgent because you need a break. Um, however, if I watch TV for six hours and I watch that rubbish TV, then it becomes not urgent, not important, if that makes sense. So if you have a long, long to-do list, have a go at putting them into those quadrants, urgent, important, not important, not urgent, and then not important or urgent. And the goal is really to move into where you're working on important things that aren't urgent because you know that you have this big project that's due next month and you're already working on it now, you're working your big strategy for the next month, um, you're doing your um, training for adventure, Ellen, so you're making sure that you that's really important, it's not yet urgent because the marathon is not tomorrow, but you have some time to build that up. So that's another tool. Um, a tool which is sort of a bit more um, general, I guess, but so important, again, we use it in all our programs, um, is time blocking. I don't know if anyone is using that, Terry, I hope you're using it by now. Um, but, um, you know, sort of blocking time in terms of knowing, and we talked about that right at the beginning, we have our big vision, our big priorities, and then looking at um, every day, what are you spending your time on? I talk about the ideal week. 
which is really planning out, okay, if I really had nothing else that was happening, if I could have a perfect pure week of blocking my week, what would it look like? And Terry gave an example. Yes, Terry likes the balls, Terry likes the time blocking. Good to hear, Terry. Um, Terry talked about, you know, let's say doing two hours. She does two hours of social media management, Monday to Friday. Um, and then she does three hours of surfing and then she does two hours of beautiful graphic designs in the afternoon or something like that. Um, very simple, I'm sure it's much more complex than that, but you see what I mean. Um, Ellen, you'll obviously want to plan your training, your adventure planning and so on. That's a big block that needs to be on your calendar. Um, in my case, again, if I want to be a writer, writing has to be on there. So again, it's taking those big rocks, balls, whatever you want to call them that you have, breaking them down into smaller pieces and making sure them that is reflected on your calendar. Um, one of you asked, was it you, Ellen, about specific um, tools and things to keep track of those projects? I always come down to the same ones. One is Toggle, if you've heard of it, T-O-G-G-L, toggle.com, T-O-G-G-L. Um, and it's literally just a time tracker. I'm sure there are lots of other apps as well. Um, but it's a great way actually to see where you're spending your time now. So even going back to the beginning of knowing what are your balls, um, you can actually see already, if you just did it this week, I would find, hang on a second, um, I say I want to be a writer, but I've only spent five minutes this week writing, or um, I've said that my health and training for my adventure is really important, but actually I only did that one training session at the beginning of the week and I haven't done anything since. So toggle to track, get T-O-G-G-L. Um, and then again, these are probably familiar with you. I use Asana, um, A-S-A-N-A, -S -A -A, and there's also Trello. Um, it's just kind of planning your lists and things. You can put them into lists, you can put them on boards, um, different tools work for you. But what you could do then, and this is a nice way for it all to fit together, if you have your five rocks, your five balls, you can colour code, this is where things get exciting, um, you can colour code your calendar, and you can colour code to have your five different boards and make sure always, visually, that you have priorities in each of those five areas. Yeah, and Ellen, if you do it for work, to be honest, my um, recommendation is always to have one calendar for work and play. It's again, that kind of work-life integration concept, really. Um, but it's making sure that you can see them at your week. Again, work is a important part, but only one important part of life. Making sure that the training's on there, you know, even having to block in date night or um, spontaneity or watching Love Island or whatever it might be, um, you know, making sure that it's not just work. And again, I do the same. I talk about this all the time. I work on it with myself and with clients. And yet somehow, sometimes the calendar, if I look at it, hang on a second, I've only been talking about this work stuff and business and so on. I've kind of forgotten about that bigger picture of um, all the other things that are important for me and for my clients as well. So I think somebody had a question, Mildred, sorry, just scrolling back. I started the time blocking, but at the end I was able to follow this in 20%. Ooh, that's an interesting one, Mildred. So, a few things. Um, I guess the one question is why you were able to only follow 20%. So, it's something that you can sort of reflect on each week. You can set up the ideal week. Get to the end of the week, you realise, actually, I was only able to do one in five of these things. Why is that? Was your plan unrealistic? Or is it because you have to make shifts and make some changes in the way you're running your priorities every day? Now, it may be, especially if you're working for somebody else, if you have a current um, income stream that is you know, dependent on clients and so on, that's not quite aligned with your other goals, it may be that in the short term, you can't just tell your, you know, I've decided that my priorities are being an adventurer and a writer and a dreamer and whatever it is, you know what, I'm gonna forget about this client and um, tell him I'm not gonna do his work anymore. Probably not possible. However, in the longer term, you can begin to shift, to steer the boat in that new direction. So this week I've noticed, you know what, I didn't play piano a single time. Next week I'm gonna play, make sure I plan it, play five minutes every day or um, even just one session a week or something. Or, oh, I only did 10 minutes of training this week. I really need to do three sessions next week of at least 20 minutes. Um, so it's again the one step remember Mildred so it's not necessarily the black and white I think if we try to change too much too soon um, then it's not going to be possible so have a look at it have a look at the little steps the little shifts you can make and then make sure you're checking in every week if it's completely unrealistic you know sometimes I played around with things like um, meditating in bed in the morning um, and I realised that actually you know what it's not the best time because I'm super sleepy I want to get up and have my breakfast I'm hungry <laughs> Um, or I want to exercise first thing in the morning, that's worked for me in the past, but now I don't want to get up early and exercise, I want to do it later in the day. And you know, sometimes you can sit there with a pen and paper and plan these things and actually when it comes down to it, it's not something you want to do. So, um, you know, really have a think about and experience if it works in practice. And maybe I say I'm going to come home and write every evening, but in the evening I'm knackered and I don't write anything particularly good. So that's not a very 
sensible. So it might seem good in theory, um, but not in practice. Again, it is the ideal week, and just to reassure you, it is never going to look exactly like that. Um, but the goal is, again, to make sure that you have these five balls, making sure those balls are represented, or you've decided that these are my absolute priorities, they have to be on your calendar. If you're not doing those things daily, weekly, and so on, you're never gonna get there. So yes, we have some short-term, urgent and important tasks, of course, um, but gradually you want to be moving again away from that um, part of the grid and towards some other things. Oh, the fabulous app. That sounds great, Amanda. Set and track daily habits. And I've used lots of apps. I can't tell you how many apps I have on my phone, so I love these recommendations. At the end of the week, you can see which habits you completed successfully, which ones you need to focus on implementing my day. That's a great recommendation, so fabulous. Um, I'll have a look too. There are some others where, you know, if you decide I want to meditate every day, for example, um, you can, well, oh, who is the, I'm sure somebody will know, who's the comedian, is it Seinfeld, who um, said he had this like system where he'd do a red cross, or is it Stephen King? Now I'm mixing up my analogies, but um, one of these incredible people said basically he was doing a cross every day and he didn't want to break the chain, it's the idea of breaking the chain. Um, if you're starting a new habit, you know, there's all sorts of um, people who say that you need to do it for 21 days or 70 days, whatever it is. But if you're introducing something new, then making sure you're tracking it with an app is um, a great idea. Mildred's saying, try to put goals per week in block time, but tend to be unrealistic. Yeah. Yes, and we all do, Mildred. We all believe we can do faster and um, more and so on than we can. But again, adjust every week and um, have a look at it and see, you know what, and also reward yourself. Aha. If you see that you've done more than you did last week, that's already good. As Amanda says, you know, visually it really encourages you to see that you've made a difference. Um, and I think we need to move away from that black and white thinking because it's either we are stuck here and we don't do any of the things we want to do or it's this perfect ideal week and that's so unrealistic, we're never going to get there. And then you get discouraged, you forget about it and you move on and you go back to your old version, right? And whereas if you think actually um, every step I take in this direction is going to get me closer and even if I never get there it will have made little changes along the way um, move away from that black and white thinking and think there's lots of shades of grey or colours of the rainbow in between. And um, we come to the end of the hour, I think those are the tools, oh the one final tool I wanted to say which is not really a tool um, but it's an important one is to learn to say no because once we have these priorities and um, if we still say yes to those requests from that guy John over there who doesn't really understand my priorities. It could be family members, friends, um, it could be colleagues, bosses, it could be ourselves. I know it's easier said than done to say no to ourselves, to our bosses, to our partners, to our friends, to our parents, whatever it is. But again, as I said with Mildred, it's a matter of moving gradually in that direction, right? It's a matter of um, making the big choices, but also then reflecting those choices in your day to day. <clears throat> so it could be that you say, rather than saying no, because that's a bit harsh, you can say, um, I'd love to do that, unfortunately right now it's not possible, can I do it next week? Or um, you don't even have to give, them the, give a reason, you know, but you know yourself, um, you tend to be unrealistic with the time that you have. So um, can I come back to you? I need to check my diary. Um, just creating some space to be able to say no. Um, so again, setting those boundaries, turning off notifications, closing the door, saying no, putting out of office in your email, whatever it might be, but we have to then say no, because again, if we come back to the beginning, if we've got those five balls and we had the, um, the marketing guru who said, you know, you can't add something without taking something away, we want to keep adding, 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 and unfortunately, um, you know, and I think we never know that we've got there until it's too late, but we will eventually burn out. We are incredible, and I'm sure you guys are all doing way too many things already, and we might thrive on that. I know my mum, for example, is someone who thrives on stress and a lot of us love that sort of, oh, I'm so busy, it's become almost a badge of honour. Um, my mum's retired now, by the way, so I think she's doing much better these days. But I think a lot of our personalities, you know, we wanna do so much, we think we can do so much and just keep adding, adding, adding. It's not possible, it's not desirable and nothing's gonna end up going well. So I think, hello, Mamnia, we're just finishing now, I'm afraid, so I need to ask you to go back to the replay, but let me know if you have any comments and questions. Um, but great to see you as well. So I think that's it. So I've, I have talked an hour, so apologies or, or um, you're welcome as the case may be, depending on how important you found what we talked about. Thank you so much everybody for your questions and your comments. Obviously a massive topic. This is something we work on a lot and I'm happy to come on, you know, if any of these aspects um, are, you know, interesting to you, we can deep dive on them again, go off on a specific direction, on a subset of it. Um, it's something I'm sure that we'll be writing more blog posts and, and podcast episodes on and happy you know to continue the conversation as well. I will post um, this sort of homework thread for us all to say what those five 
and um, balls are. Um, and again, if you want to message me privately, that's fine too. Um, but I hope that was helpful. Thanks to everybody who came up with this topic. I think it's an important one. Again, we probably haven't solved the world's problem this evening. Hopefully you've got one idea, whether you start using the toggle tracker, you go off and do your balls, um, <clears throat> use time blocking perhaps, um, or you just you know take yourself out of the situation and take a break um, so you can really um, reflect on what really is important. Hopefully you can come away with one thing, one step of course, which is the goal um, that will make a little bit of a difference. And then we keep remembering that discipline is remembering what we want and we take that consistent action every day, every week and so on. A pleasure, Amanda. Thanks so much everybody for being so active. It makes my life so much more, um, so much easier and so much more fun to be here with you guys. So I hope you like this new format of the sort of deep dive workshop. Um, again, it'll be a few weeks now, obviously, until the next one. So we'll do another one in August. Um, if you have any ideas off the top of your head now, later, for topics, let me know. Um, and then we'll be coming back once we have a few topics, we'll do a bit of a vote again so you guys can really shape what the topic will be next time. And again, we can continue on this kind of similar thing. It could be something completely different. It might fit with what we're doing over the blog or might not. So hopefully that's useful. Um, great, Terry. I'm happy to hear that once a month is good and hopefully, you know, we'll get it in the diary. We'll be spamming you guys a bit more with messages and um, posts just to make sure that you see it. Cause I know again, it's easy to miss it. and. I don't know about you, but I get way too many Facebook notifications these days, so it's hard to um, see these things. We'll get them into the diary, but I think once a month, you know, we have so many other things. We have other things to do in our evenings and so on, so um, hopefully that will be good for all of you. Thank you so much, Mildred. Really nice to see you all. Familiar faces and some new ones as well. Um, Work-life integration article I'm going to share. I think there was something else which I've now forgotten. Oh, Terry, I was going to put you in touch with Rachel, and then we'll do the five balls homework. But thanks so much, everybody. Really lovely to spend the last hour with you. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in the group in the coming days and weeks and next month as well when we do our new topic. Thank you so much and um, good luck with your balls. <laughs> See you soon.